What does it take to be a Christian? There is in the world today a bewildering array of people, all of whom cost, call themselves Christians, and yet with an incredible diversity of belief, practice, philosophy, teachings, doctrines, liturgy. It, it, it really is mind-boggling when you begin to try to grapple with the differences that exist between people. In fact, if there's any way Christians can differ from one another, it would seem they long ago must have found it. The Catholic Church today presents a kind of an image of this huge monolith that is all unified and pulled together, and yet the closer you get to it and the closer you look, the more you find the Catholic Church is torn by sectarianism and strife and that there are liberal conservative elements and there are many ways in which the church is divided even though it appears on the surface to be together. And of course, historically, uh, it has created more spin-offs than any other church or organization in the history of man. And sometimes for the most incredible of reasons. In fact, the greatest difference that exists in, in, among Catholics today is the great division between East and West, that is the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Western Roman Catholic Church, is uh, over a thing that is so small that you and I would have difficulty in figuring out why that difference exists. The difference really boils down to the question of whether the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son or from the Father through the Son. The notorious filioque clause is in one of the early uh, uh, creeds of the church. Now, of course, it goes much deeper than that, but that is the surface thing that was used actually to divide the church permanently, it would seem, and irrevocably, and that really didn't take place, that full division, until about the 10th century. So it's, uh, it's rather interesting to see the way people have, have split themselves up. Then you have Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and Christian churches and churches of God and as if that weren't enough, you, among Baptists, you've got Free Will Baptists, Hard Shell Baptists, Old German Baptists, Northern Baptists, Missionary Baptists, Southern Baptists, American Baptists, and Two Seed in the Spirit, Predestinarian Baptists. I mean, that's only a, a partial listing. The Missionary Baptists, by the way, are distinguished by the fact that they don't believe, do not believe in foreign missions, which I thought was rather interesting. Uh, even within a single group like the Southern Baptists, you can have those who believe in open communion and those who are closed communion, and you can have a difference in one church and the next. You can be a member of a Baptist church in one, one place and not be able to partake of communion with a Baptist church in another place. There are those who are premillennialist, postmillennialist, amillennialist, that is in their look toward uh, prophecy and the way things are going. And, of course, then there's the Church of God, which has, is divided rather abruptly between Seventh-day churches of God, or Sabbath-keeping churches of God, and those that observe Sunday. And I couldn't even begin to guess how many churches of God there are who observe Sunday and how they differ. Among the churches that keep the Sabbath, though, you have an incredible variety of those who just claim to be Church of God, quote, Seventh Day, end quote, for they have divided administratively and for various and sundry reasons. Uh, you have the Caldwell, Idaho Church. In fact, there are two church, two different groups of the Churches of God, Seventh Day, each of whom headquarter in different towns in Idaho. You have another group that headquarter in Denver, another one in Stanbury, Missouri, another was the Oregon Conference of it. Then you had the Jerusalem headquartered group that Duggar founded whenever he made a split with, I guess, the Stanbury group, and so on it goes. And I've lost track of them a long time ago as to how many different ways they go, and I'm sure this list is, is very incomplete. And then, of course, there is the Worldwide Church of God with its group of spinoffs, such as the Church of God International, the Biblical Church of God, the 20th Century Church of God. We all wondered what would happen when the 21st century came around. Then there is a, uh, the Associated Churches of God, and then there was, uh, I forget the names of some of them, but I do know who provided leadership. There is a group now that meets with Raymond Cole. There's another group with Paul Royer. Bryce Clark, I think, believe, has a group, and even Cecil Battles. Uh, these all head various spinoff groups of the what used to be the Worldwide Church of God. And, of course, even the Church of God International has a few tiny, uh, relatively insignificant spinoffs, but give us enough time. And we get a little larger, and, and, and some of those little spinoffs can develop, and we'll live. Who knows where all that will go? Now, all these people, from Baptists all the way to Raymond Cole, or whatever you know particular way you want to measure it, all claim to be Christian, don't they? Now, some of them believe that other church groups, even church groups radically different from their own, are also Christian. You know, they'd walk up, they'd walk into any church anywhere, and they would be feel like they were with brethren, that they were not with non-Christians, but rather with Christian people. Yet, and then there are others who believe that only their church is truly Christian, and all others are false, Christian churches falsely so-called. They do not grant that they really are truly Christian. They would say, in fact, there are Sunday-keeping churches that believe that their group 
is the only true group of saved people and that every even other you know Christian people are going to hell if they are not a member of their particular denomination group or or sect. Now this is all real interesting. And you have to ask the question, what does it take to really be a Christian? For if you kind of visualize from this from, from that wall to this wall over here, right against that wall, a last coat of paint on this wall over here would be a group of people who call themselves Christian who do not even believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who don't believe it really makes much difference what you do, uh, who don't believe in the preexistence of Christ, that he was the Son, or even, you know, his divinity. And then against this wall over here, you have some very arch-conservative uh, hardliners who believe in uh, uh, a total exclusivistic approach to things and who may have quit their jobs and be sitting there waiting for the return of Christ. Now, you know, all the way across here, in innumerable myriads of multitudes, Christians seem to be sort of spread, you know, just like you took them with a knife or a trowel and just evenly distributed them from one into the other. You have this whole great broad spectrum of belief. And there doesn't seem to be anywhere where everybody all settles down and, and some solid group of people clearly, obviously, are in the center of it all. What does it take to really be a Christian? Now, you're ready for a surprise. There is absolutely no indication that Paul or James, or Luke, or John, or Peter, ever considered themselves Christian at all. You know, here we are. We're talking about who's a Christian. Well, he's a Christian, but he can't be a Christian because he doesn't believe this, that, or the other thing. And we could spend a lot of time arguing about who's a Christian and who's not. And the funny thing about it is the Apostle Paul may never have considered himself, or Barnabas, or Silas, or any of the rest of them as Christians. In fact, there's every reason to believe they didn't even care very much for the word or term Christian. They may, they, in fact, in their letters, from the beginning to the end, not one person, no group of people are ever addressed as Christians. Did you realize that? There is no letter that begins to all the Christians of Asia Minor or to all the Christians that are in Ephesus or all the Christians over there in Rome. They never at any time address the church or brethren as Christian. They use the term brethren. They talk to the saints. They talk to the elect, to the beloved, or to the assembly that's in a certain place. Never do they ever address anybody as Christians. Well, you might wonder, maybe they didn't really know the term. Were they just not that familiar? Was it a, a later development? Oh, no. Oh, no. It was a quite early development. In fact, one of the, the, the first reference to the word Christian in your Bible is found in the 11th chapter of the book of Acts. We read in verse 22 of Acts 11, Tidings of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas that he should go forth as far as Antioch, whom when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad, and he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave to the Lord. This is shortly after the beginning of the Antioch church. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and much people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went off to Tarsus to seek Saul and brought him back. When he had brought him, to Antioch it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And then almost as just an aside, Luke tosses it in as a historical note. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now this is probably in the late 30s. It could be as early, you know, as 37 or 38, certainly in the early 40s, long time before the Jerusalem conference uh, took place. You're just following through on the sequence of events. This is a very early occurrence uh, and use of the word. So definitely they knew about it. No epistle had been written at this time, not one. No gospel account had been written at this time, not one. None of the writings that you and I refer to in the New Testament, including the book of Acts, had been written when this took place. So they were called Christians in Antioch, but they never adopted the term. Forty to fifty years later, they still were not using it. Now there's every indication that as time went by, the term was adopted by people who, are, who believed in Christ, and they did wear the term with a certain amount of pride, but not at first. Why did they not use it? Was it because it was a, a derogatory term? It probably was. The fact is, if you'll notice, it was not they themselves who called themselves that. It says the disciples were called. They, people hung this appellation on them first at Antioch. Now, no one knows or could tell you the place or the time when Jews were first called kikes, can they? We all know, though, that 
kike is a derogatory term, is an epithet to you that people have used where Jewish people are concerned, and Jewish people really don't care for that term at all and do not use it at all concerning themselves. Is it possible that the term Christian was spit out like an epithet against the church and that they didn't care for that any more than a Jew cared for being called a kike? Or a member of the Church of Christ liked to be called a Camelite? Or a member of the Worldwide Church of God likes to be called an Armstrongite? People are always hanging names on you. They like to get you in a pigeonhole or a box. And sometimes those names can be used in a way that's really not all that encouraging. Well, the term Christian is only used three times in the Bible. Let's just take a peek at them and see how it's used. This was the first time. It just says they were called by other people, Christians first in Antioch. In Acts the 26th chapter is the next reference, and it's a reference that I think may have been misused a few times historically. The Apostle Paul is making his speech, his defense, before Agrippa. And it goes on at considerable length. And he begins to conclude after he had been, in, after Festus, sitting by, said, Paul, verse 24, you are beside yourself. Much learning has made you mad. These people were not really respectful of Paul. They were listening to his defense. And when they heard the things he was saying, they thought he was crazy. Much learning has made you mad. He says, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knows these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now people have looked at that as though Agrippa is responding in a positive way to Paul's exhortation as though he himself were almost, really almost converted. But the word almost is very important. You know, he didn't say that you are persuading me to be. He said, almost you persuade me to be. And then if you think for a moment and realize that this word Christian is not a term that Christians used of themselves. It was a derogatory term that other people used as a put down of the followers or disciples of Christ then this man may have been speaking sarcastically. He may very well have been himself putting Paul down when he said, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. You could sort of imagine it if someone or some Jew were making his defense and a guy listening to him said, well, you almost persuade me to be a kike yourself. It wouldn't carry quite the same meaning as of one who was almost converted, would it? And I think that old hymn, almost persuaded, probably comes from this particular uh, verse, which is, I don't think at all the sense that Agrippa used the terms at all. Almost you persuade me to be a, a Christian may not have been a particularly complimentary expression at all. The third and last place that this is used in the Bible is over in 1 Peter 4, and I think we ought to look at it with this in mind. 1 Peter 4 and verse 15. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. Here the term Christian is, is, is associated with suffering and with shame. And if the term was derogatory in its first century and earliest use, you can see why Peter would have pulled that term out and didn't say, now if any of you suffer as a saint, or as a disciple of Jesus, or as, uh, as one of the brethren. No, no, he said, as a Christian. Talking about an accusing type of term that people would have placed on the church and would have been a, an expression oftentimes used uh, in a derogatory sense. So when you look at it that way, you realize that the term Christian has its origins outside the church. It did not have its origins with Christ, or with John, or Matthew, or with Paul, or with Luke, or with any of the biblical writers, and that even though the term was commonly used as an epithet against the church, or a descriptive term of the church, they eschewed to use that term, never applied it, and never addressed anyone in the church by that name throughout their lifetime. We come down to the last of the epistles of John, which were probably written 50 years after the church Christians were first called you know, called that in Antioch, and he never uses the term at all. I think that's significant. I think it's something we have to look at. Now, Luke noted that it was disciples who were called Christian first in Antioch. A disciple is a pupil 
a learner, or a follower of a great teacher. It doesn't imply anything about a person's deg the degree of a person's acceptance or his involvement with or his commitment to that teacher. A disciple is somebody who sits at the feet and listens and learns as he goes along. The word disciple implies nothing about a person's acceptance of Jesus as the Son of God. It doesn't mean he believes that Jesus was the creator, that he was God incarnate, or even that they have accepted him as their own personal savior. All it means is they have pulled up a chair or a rock and sat down and sit at Jesus' feet and learn from him. That's all. Now today, in the 20th century, there are people who call themselves Christian who do not believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. They do not believe he existed before his human birth. They do not believe he is the creator. They do not believe he was the son of God any more than Buddha or Mohammed was the son of God. They believe he was a great philosopher or a great moral teacher, and they subscribe to his teachings in general. And so they would say, well, yes, I am a Christian, as opposed to being a Buddhist or a Muslim or uh, whatever other kind of religion it is that I might be involved in. Now, to be fair, it doesn't really seem totally wrong to call people who believe in Jesus Christ as Christians, does it? I mean, it's, it's a, it is, after all, a term that the church never applied to itself. It is a very broad term, and if you look in a dictionary to find out what the term means, well, in the most broad and general sense, uh, maybe it isn't wrong for a person who says, well, I believe in Jesus, uh, to call himself a Christian. But what does believing in Christ accomplish? I want you to turn back with me to the book of John, to a scripture that I think may surprise a few people. I hope some of you might eventually share the tape of this sermon with some people that I think may learn some rather striking new things from it. John, the second chapter, and verse 23. Now, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, I would have to say this, that if you had been there and you had actually seen Jesus lay hands on the sick and see them healed and see somebody's withered arms straightened out and, and see a crippled man rise up and walk or a man born blind see, it would be very difficult for you not to at least emotionally respond with some sort of belief in this man or belief in his name, which is in itself a rather interesting expression. What do you mean, believe in his name? Does that mean believe that his name was Jesus? Well, you know, obviously his name was Jesus. There he was. But to believe in his name means to believe in his authority, or perhaps to believe in what his name meant, that he was a savior, for here he was saving people all over the place. They believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. And I've heard preachers basically say that all you have to do is just believe in the name of Jesus. Listen to what he says. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and he needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. Now that's, that's fascinating. For here were people who saw his miracles and believed in his name. We have the testimony of John that they believed in his name and that Jesus would not commit himself or entrust himself to those people. For he knew the character of man, he knew the heart of man, and obviously he did not believe there had been any change in the heart of these men, simply because they had believed in his name. Now, they could call themselves Christians, couldn't they? They believed, I mean, if this term had been in use at this time, which it wasn't, if they had believed in his name, somehow or other they, you would think that it had brought about some kind of a change. Turn back a little further to the 12th chapter of John. To another interesting expression. John the 12th chapter and verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. Now that would be impressive. You know, here are the chief rulers, not just some, some uh, uh, local functionaries, but many, not a few, among the chief rulers believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Discipleship. This is a shocking thing to me to realize. Discipleship. Believing discipleship can leave a person unwilling to confess Christ and loving the praise of men more than the praise of God. Where have we gotten ourselves by believing 
in or on or about or whatever you know, preposition you want to use. Jesus Christ, if it still leaves us loving the praise of men more than the praise of God and afraid to confess Jesus Christ. Very little change has taken place in us if that is the case. And that can indeed be the case. It would seem from reading through this that believing in Jesus Christ is a very superficial step for a person to make along the road toward conversion, toward the kingdom of God, or to whatever goal one perceives to be somewhere out on the link. Do I, am I saying that believing in Christ is a bad thing? Of course not. Believing in Christ is the first step along the road to something else, but it is only a step, and it is certainly not enough. Now, turn with me back to the 8th chapter of Acts, to another rather fascinating illustration of our problem we're dealing with of just what does it take to be a Christian. We read here about the persecution that arose against the church at Jerusalem and how they were scattered abroad everywhere, how Saul went, made havoc of the church and also contributed to the scattering of the church. We're told then in verse 5 that Philip, as a result of this persecution, went down to Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the people with one, one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. Many people were taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. There was great joy in that city. There was a certain man, however, called Simon, who before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they all had regard, because for a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Now notice verse 12. But when they believed Philip concerning uh, the, the things of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed. Wow, you know, here is this man, he really believed. And when he was baptized, now unlike those who would not confess Christ, he actually took the additional step of the outward confession of Christ, which baptism really is. I mean, you see, you, you go into the waters of baptism, you submit to that act, you are confessing that you are a sinner, that you deserve to die, that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. He went through this whole rigmarole of believing and of baptizing, and he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs that were done. Now then, is this man converted? Is he, you know, a Christian, a really true Christian at this point in time? Read on. When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. When they came down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had fallen upon none of them yet. They were just baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also the power that on whomsoever I may lay hands he may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You have neither part nor a lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. This is a man who had believed, and nobody else said, nobody even equivocates about whether his belief was true or not. He was baptism, bab I'm sorry, baptized, and now we come to the place to where we are told his, he wasn't right with God. And so then he, Peter goes on to say, Repent, therefore, of this wickedness, and pray God that perhaps the thought of your heart will be forgiven you, for I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Now that's really sobering, because here you, we find that you can be a believer, that you can be a disciple, that you can confess Christ, that you can be baptized and still not be right with God. Well, Simon, according to Peter, still needed to repent. He'd gone through these things, but repentance was not a factor yet in his life. Turn back a few more pages to the 15th chapter of Acts. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Certain men, which came down from Judea, taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
Now, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem and get this question resolved. And so they went on down to them and were told, verse 4, when they came to, the, to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders and they declared all the things that God had done with them. But that there had risen up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses, which includes all the sacrifices and ordinances and customs and so forth. And all this was, according to verse 1, in order to be saved. Now, every person there, I guess, except this particular group, knew better than that. Paul knew better. Barnabas knew better. Peter knew better. John knew better. And James knew better. They all knew that this was wrong. These men were absolutely, totally dead wrong. So we find a person can believe, confess Christ, be baptized, even teach others, and still not be right with God. Now that's uh, really pretty sobering when you think about it. That then it really boils down to a very simple equation: that belief in Christ, and apparently even the confession of Christ, and apparently even baptism, and apparently even being coming to coming to some kind of a level that you might consider yourself a teacher, is not enough. What is? Well, I think it would be a good idea if we knew that, don't you? And with all these people wandering around calling themselves Christians and with this kind of a dispute even possibly existing, I think it's important that we know. Turn back to Luke, the sixth chapter. I'm going to begin with the context in verse 20. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are hungering now, you shall be filled. Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Where are we? Well, naturally, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount. All very interesting. He goes down and he talks about all of the tremendous requirements that he is going to be laying upon his disciples. In verse 27, I say unto you that hear me, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. To him that smites you on one cheek, offer him the other also. Him that takes away your cloak, don't forget him to take away your coat. Verse 31, as you would that men should do to you, you do to them also likewise. And so on with all of these principles, beautiful principles of the Sermon on the Mount. What does all this mean? He says in verse 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And why do you call me Lord, Lord? and do not the things that I say. Now that's interesting. For there are all sorts of people in this world who call Jesus their Lord, and who profess, actually take his name upon themselves, who call themselves by this rather doubtful or dubious name Christian, and yet having called themselves by his name, will not do the things that he said. Now when you read the Sermon on the Mount, there's one thing that is pretty impressive as you go through there. These requirements are very high. This thing of forgiving your enemies, this thing of loving those people that hate you, this thing of turning the other cheek, and what do, I, do I need to go on with those principles of the Sermon on the Mount, some of the, the highest teaching ever offered to mankind, where Jesus took what were relatively simple and easy to live with principles of the Ten Commandments. For indeed, the principles of the Ten Commandments of simply not bearing false witness or simply not uh, lying to one another, or simply not stealing from one another, are not nearly as high and lofty as are those elaborations that we find in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. And then Jesus looked around and said, Why do you call me your Lord when you won't do the things that I say? And he had just gone through the process of elaborating on, laying out for them, and showing them just exactly how high the standards were that he was laying out for them. There is, it seems to me, in the world a very curious contradiction. You have, if you look around for them, and you can oftentimes go to their campaigns, you can see them on television if you'd rather not go, but there are a lot of preachers who go to and fro in the earth and walk up and down in it, and one of the key elements of their message as they go is how easy it is to be saved. And indeed, it must be fairly easy by their standards, for they can have dozens or perhaps scores or perhaps even hundreds 
maybe even thousands in rare circumstances, saved in a campaign that they may have in a given city as they go through. Now, all this is interesting to me, as I say, when I compare what they say with what Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 13. Enter you in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there are that go in there, thereat, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Now, you know, who's right? Here is Jesus telling us that the way to life is narrow, and here's a whole bunch of ministers telling us that the way to life is broad and easy, and we've got room for all kinds of people to come rolling in this way. Now, the question, though, that I have when I come up on this is, why is it that so few people find the way to life? Because it is so hard? Because it's really complicated? Because it's, 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 it's a difficult concept, or it demands so much of us? Now, I want you to consider this simple sequence of ideas. And I want you to ask yourself just how tough this is. One, sin is the transgression of the law. Two, the wages of sin is death. Three, Jesus died for our sins. Four, therefore, he can forgive us of our sins. Five, in order to be forgiven, we must repent. Six, people who are repentant don't keep on committing the same sins. Seven, we must accept Jesus as our personal Savior. That is, we must agree to his sacrifice and agree to him applying it to ourselves. Now, that is really very simple, isn't it? It's very clear, and it's absolutely supportable in the Scriptures. I mean, it's, it's so simple as child's play for a person to take himself down through that sequence. But half of the world seems to be looking for something easier, and the other half of the world seems to be looking for something harder. And it seems as though people, either for whatever reasons, cannot accept that simple sequence of concepts. They've got to find something more involved, something that is easier, or something that is harder to reach out to, or else somehow or other they've got to come back and find something that is much easier. Well, Jesus did it all for you. There is nothing, whatever, you have to do for yourself. Now, it's not so hard, it would seem, to be a Christian. But does it get you anywhere? That, to me, is, I think, the important question. I want you to turn back to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, to a, an interesting thing that has led, I think, to a very large misunderstanding of some sort with people. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, in verse 3, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the, uh, the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people have read that, and then you will begin to see it cropping up on bumper stickers, or you'll find it on stationery, or you'll find it on a business card, or, as I've seen it once, on the, uh, on the wall of an establishment, of an eating establishment. Now, it was interesting. We used to go to this place a lot to eat. We used to enjoy the food there. It was well prepared, and, and the people there were congenial, and so we kept finding ourselves sometimes driving quite a long distance to a place to get a sandwich or something because we liked the food there very much, and we passed over a lot of places that were more convenient. Well, the man did well in his business, and he finally sold his business out for a nice profit, and he took off, I guess, to Florida. The gentleman who bought it by, from him stayed there with him for a long time, and he showed him how to do whatever it was he did and to serve exactly the same food exactly the same way. This man moved in. One of the first things he did was put the little plaque up over the door, Jesus is Lord. And the second thing he did was to lower the quality of his food. You know, we, we kept going back for a long time, and it would be very difficult for me today to tell you exactly what's different about it, but the food is not as good. Now, you know, it seems to me that when a person starts t tacking the name of Jesus onto his business, for whatever reason, he really takes an enormous responsibility. That he may be, right on the surface of it, taking Jesus' name in vain when he uses it on his business card or his, or his stationery or sticks it on a bumper of his card. I'm not sure. But I will say this, that whenever you tack Jesus' name 
onto your business, and then you go out and you, in any way, cheat somebody, cut someone, uh, take something away, reduce your quality, or don't carry on through, or don't set the right example, you've taken Jesus' name in vain. You're far safer, you know, to keep Jesus in your life where he belongs, and, and don't go hanging his name on your business. Uh, that is, unless you really are prepared to you, you'll follow his instructions right all the way through about the way in which things are to be done. You know, if you turn back with me again to Matthew, the seventh chapter, to that same scripture we were at before, we want to go just a little further with it. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. He said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bearing forth good, brings forth good fruit. A corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now, later on, he will use this beautiful example about the man. He said, whoever hears these sayings of mine, verse 24, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man that built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon it. And it didn't fall because it was founded on a rock. Everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened to the foolish man that built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Now that all makes a lot of sense, doesn't it, really, when you think about it. There's nothing particularly unusual about this. We all know. I mean, it's an article of faith. We grew up knowing that we didn't even need the Bible to tell us this. That when the chips are down, it's not what we say. It's what we do that makes a difference. We have a little saying in our world, isn't it? Put your money where your mouth is. It's a big deal for you to talk about it. Let's see you put some action behind it. Let's, let's get some money up on the line and see if you really do believe what it is you want to, quote, bet, end quote, on. And so it is with every aspect of our lives. We, we actually call a man a four-flusher who makes promises and claims that he can do things that he actually cannot do or will not follow through with, don't we? We're not very impressed by people, be he a car salesman, be he a builder, be he whatever he may be. If he promises and doesn't follow through, words don't mean anything. Now, let me ask you a question. If we all know this about the business world, about our life and our association with people in this world, how much more should it not be so with Christianity? How could we possibly think that words were enough? How could we possibly not believe and know and hold as a conviction it was not what we say, but what we do that makes a difference. And whether we're going to live by the things that Jesus said when we take his name upon us ourselves, or our stationery, or our business, or put it on a wall of a place where we do business. Pretty critical when you stop really thinking those things through. Matthew, the 18th chapter, Jesus kind of brings a little bit of this, I think, into focus. Chapter 18 and verse 1. At the same time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we're not talking about how great you're going to be yet. We're talking about whether you're even going to be in the kingdom or not. Whoever shall be converted. Now, what's that word mean? That, that's, a, that's a tough word there when you stop to think this sort of conversion, whatever it is, is, is heavy business. Oh, it's really a very simple word. We oftentimes, I think, mix up our words a little bit as far as the interpretation from the Greek. We tend to think that word repent means to sort of stop and turn around and go the other way. No, not really. That's what conversion is. The word convert means simply in the Greek to turn again. That real hard word, isn't it? to turn again. The word repent means basically to be sorry. We have really agonized over these things in baptism, you know, counselings and so forth. It's nothing, no big deal. To say repent and be converted is nothing bigger than saying what you need to do is to be sorry and turn your life around. That's all it means. Be sorry and turn around. Turn back. Turn again. Now, so we're dealing not merely with a feeling and not merely with words, but a physical turning of our life. Now, except you then turn around 
and become like little children. Okay, how are we supposed to become like little children? Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Ah, a totally different attitude, a totally different frame of mind seems to be called for. You know what's funny to me is how often it is that religion finds expression in pride and self-righteousness and even arrogance. It, it's pride seems, you know, arrogance. So they seem so, so at home in a religious environment. And yet they have nothing to do with religion as far as Jesus' teaching was concerned, the way he tried to impress upon, upon these people what they were supposed to do. Well, then, what does God want from us, you know, in order to, to somehow qualify to have, if someone were writing a letter to us, to say to the saints, or to write to you and say, my dearly beloved brother, you know, as opposed to calling us a Christian, because, you know, anybody can be a Christian. What does it take to really be a brother of Jesus Christ? Now, these, the answers to these really are not really complicated questions. They are familiar to us all. Acts, the second chapter, if you'll turn back to it. So people heard a sermon from Peter. They were pricked in their conscience and in their heart. And they said to Peter, well, now, men and brethren, what am I supposed to do about what you have just told me? They didn't think it was just a matter of words. They had to do something. Verse 38 of Acts 2. Then Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's not too complicated. Repentance, that being sorry, that's one of the first things a person's got to do. Is that enough? Notice in chapter 3, in verse 19, he says, Repent you therefore, and be converted. Uh -huh. Be sorry, and turn around. Change your life. Get, make, make a turn. Make a change in the things that you're doing so that your sins may be blotted out. Ah, well, the implication here is that unless I am sorry and unless I turn, my sins can't be blotted out. Yeah, yep, yeah, there we are. There it is, staring you right in the face. In order for your sins to be blotted out, you have got to be sorry and you have got to make a turn. All right, now that's not too difficult to get it. But now, some people feel, well, shouldn't it be a little harder than that formula you gave us? You know, because, you know, basically that formula calls for a person changing his life, you know, for seeing that Jesus Christ died for his sins, being sorry for that, what he has done, accepting Jesus' sacrifice, and then, of course, turning his life around. And he's got, you, you can't, I mean, it should be clear to anybody that you cannot keep on doing the things that Christ died because you did before and forgave you of, right? Somebody forgives you of something, you're not supposed to keep on doing it. But somebody says, well, shouldn't it be a, there be a little bit more to it than that? That's a frequently asked question. Romans, the 10th chapter, answers the question, answers it strongly. Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. They were in that, that half of the world that goes around looking for something more, for something harder, for something that they have to reach out for because they know that God is very demanding and we've all got to be just as demanding as God and we've got to somehow get to some, you know, this righteousness into our lives. He then says, Christ is the object of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses describes the righteousness of the law that the man that does these things shall live in them, live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise, now, this is interesting. This is a paraphrase. He doesn't take the scripture here, which he just now seems to be quoting, directly out of the Old Testament. But rather he paraphrases it to fit what he is talking about now. He says, Say not in your heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? The old original statement out of the law was, Who shall ascend into heaven to bring the law? You know, we can't go up and get the law for ourselves. God delivered that to us. But you see, Jesus is the law. And that's why he paraphrases it in this way. Don't say in your heart, who shall go up into heaven to bring Christ down from above? Who shall descend into the deep that is to bring Christ up again from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that shall be saved. Now that's heavy stuff. A lot of people take that and they say, well, that's, you know, all you got to do is believe 
And then they get you to come down the aisle and to publicly confess. And it's almost implied that it doesn't really make any difference how you live your life from that day on. Now, when you start trying to really get that question into focus with people, they will usually backwater and say, well, if you really are a Christian, you will live your life this, this way. It is not that you have to do it, but you will do it. But to me, that's double talk. That's just plain double talk. The truth is that everyone knows that just because you have repented and been baptized does not mean you can just live any way you please from there on out. Nobody believes that. And yet there is so much dancing around about what is required for the simple reason that if we emphasize at that point in your life that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, we suddenly have some tough questions to answer, such as, what in the world do we do about the Sabbath day? And really, it all boils down to that and a few other commandments that present problems if we emphasize the fact that after a person's baptism, he is supposed to live according to God's law. And that's where a lot of the semantics and a lot of the arguments come from. What's Paul saying? Paul is making a very clear statement to all of us and to all the world for all time. There is not one thing that you can do yourself to accomplish your salvation. Nothing. You're helpless. You can't go up into heaven and bring Christ down. And once he was dead and buried, you couldn't go down in the grave and bring him up. There was nothing in the world that you could do. But now, does that mean that there isn't anything that you can do at all? Other people will ask, well, isn't, isn't this, shouldn't this all be a little bit easier than this formula you have suggested? I mean, do we really have to, to do all these things? Well, Paul was addressing one group of people. And in order to address their problems, he spoke about one side of this question. James, on the other hand, was addressing a different group of people, and he addressed a different side of the same question. The second chapter of James, beginning in verse 10, he says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now, if you commit no adultery, but if you kill, you are become a transgressor of the law. So speak you, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now, who's he writing to? Well, he's writing to the brethren, to the saints, Christians, if you want to call them that. For he shall have judgment without mercy, who has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man says he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Now, the implicit answer of James is, no, your faith by itself is not enough that actually there's going to have to be some works. And of course, what did Jesus say? He said, look, you can't stand up here and talk a good fight. You've got to live it, my friend. You've got to do some things. You can't just say you believe and then not do. You've got to do when the chips are down. He says, if a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you do not give them the things that are needful for the body, how much good have you done that person? What's James arguing in this point? What he's arguing is you, it doesn't do you any good to talk a good fight. You can talk about faith. You can say you got faith. You can go all, you can take, take the name of Jesus Christ and you can wear it on the lapel of your jacket. And you have accomplished nothing. Absolutely nothing. Any more than telling a hungry man be warmed and filled is going to make him warm and full. Even so, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead being alone. Oh, yes, a man may say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. So what's Paul talking about when he says believes and is baptized? He's talking about the person who really sincerely believes down in his heart and his life is changed by that belief. You believe there is one God? Oh, well, that's good. The devils believe and tremble. Now, you know, when you put that in perspective, with men who believed in Jesus and would not confess him because they, are, they valued the, the praise of men more than the praise of God. Just believing in Christ, does that really accomplish something? Listen to James's response. You believe there is? Oh, that's good. The devils believe and tremble. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? 
Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Do you see how faith wrought with his works and by worth, with works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was, was fulfilled which said Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Do you see what James is saying? James is saying we knew that Abraham believed God because of what he did. And when he had done it, it was then said that Abraham believed God. And so when Paul says, believe and be baptized, he's not merely talking about walking down and shaking the preacher's hand and saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. He's talking about the kind of belief that Abraham showed by the things that Abraham did. This is the belief that leads a person on to true baptism and to conversion and eventually on that very narrow road that leads to life. The scripture was fulfilled that said Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. We know practically nothing about Abraham about Rahab's belief. We just know what she did. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works dead. But you know, there really is nothing easy about your salvation. There came a time when Jesus Christ came right up to the day and right up to the night and after he'd eaten the last supper with his disciples and went over into the valley of Gethsemane and kneeled down to pray before God that he desperately with every fiber of his being wanted not to go through with what he had to do the next day. You know, you, you kind of think, well, Jesus was strong. Jesus was able to carry through. And, and, and you sort of visualize, we visualize in our own mind men of strength like Abraham. We think that, that when Abraham was called upon to sacrifice his son, he said, oh, okay, fine. God tells me to go sacrifice my son. And he just went out and did it. No, no. It wasn't like that. These were people like you and I. They weren't great supermen, you know, with, with incredible faith that, that, that transcends anything you or I could have. They were people who agonized at, by, by the hour. I think that movie, the Bible, where George C. Scott played Abraham, the absolute agonizing that that man did over the question of sacrificing his son is a lot closer to the truth than what some of us tend to feel when we simply read the biblical account and says, go do it, and Abraham got up and did it without realizing how human the man was and how hard that was for him to do. And the Jesus, Superman, when he got into the garden that night and he said, oh, Father, if it be possible, let this thing pass from me, and his sweat was like great drops of blood falling on the ground. He sweat blood over that, not wanting to go through what he had to go through with the next day. And so he went through humiliation, shame, agony, and death. Our salvation was not an easy thing to do. Now, with him having done that, is it so hard for us to do what he says, to keep his commandments, to honor him, to be sorry for the things that we have done that are wrong and stop doing the things that were wrong and start doing the things that are right. Is that so tough? Is that really so hard? Truth to tell, I honestly believe that so few people find the way of life because they keep trying to make it something more or something less than what it is. Yes, you have to keep the law. Breaking the law was what got you in trouble in the first place. And you're going to have to stop breaking the law and start keeping the law, not only because it hurts you, but in order to honor God through obedience to him. No, you cannot make it all right by keeping the law when you have already broken it. Obeying the law and being diligent in obeying the law and even to the point of doing sacrifices cannot pay the penalty for the things that you have already done. Now, there are indeed millions of Christians in the world because it is easy enough to be a Christian. But merely being a Christian will not get you very far. There are maybe actually millions of Christians who will not enter into life. You know, that's an that's, that's a astonishing thing to realize. There may be millions of Christians who will not enter into life. Go back again with me one more time to Matthew, the seventh chapter. Jesus said you're going to know everybody by their fruits. And then he says in verse 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, 
shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone that has it on his business card, the wall of his restaurant, or on his stationery, or the bumper of his car. Not everyone that attends church and claims to be a Christian. Not everyone who says, well, yeah, it's, isn't it good to know the Lord, brother? Not every one of them, he says, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What is the will of God? What is the will of the Father? Man, how long have we had this book? You know, how, how far do we have to go to try to find an expression of the will of God? Paul says, it's not enough in heaven that you have to go up and get it and bring it back. It's not down in the bowels of the earth you have to dig down and bring it up. It's near you. You're sitting there holding your hands. What do you mean, know the will of God? He says, not everyone, but those who do the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many, not a few, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Oh, anybody can use his name. And in your name have we not cast out demons? And in your name have done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. You know what that means? It means lawlessness. Anomia in the Greek just takes the word for law and puts a negation in front of it. You no law people. That's really what the word means. You workers of lawlessness. What's fascinating in, is it, is that these are all people who claim his name. They might very well call themselves Jesusites or say I belong to Jesus or Jesus is my Lord or I am a Christian in the process. And he's going to look right at them after they have made the claim of having done works of having taught in his name, of having, you know, healed the sick perhaps, or cast out demons or what have you, and are going to come to him, he's going to say, who are you? I, I don't know you. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. And then follows this beautiful example about the man who built his house upon a rock. And what's the difference in these two men? One of them heard and didn't do. The other one heard it and did it. It's just as simple as that. In verse 28 it says, It came to pass that when Jesus had ended all these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, you know, I've thought about it a long time now, this word Christian. I've all the years where we have wanted to put Christian in quotes and say, well, you know, false Christians and true Christians and, and quote Christians, in quote, and so forth. Oh, I don't know. Maybe they are all Christians, you know, if you want to just take that term in the way that it's historically been used. But the Apostle Paul, while he might have called them Christians, would never have called them a brother and could never have addressed them as saints. And some of them are going to be people that Jesus would look at and say, look, <laughs> you tell me about all these things and you call me Lord and you call yourself by my name. But you know, there's something funny I've noticed. You seem to have no interest at all in doing the things that I tell you to do. Now, here's a spectrum of Christians all the way from the one end of doctrine or ideas and all the way to the other end. Those who don't believe there's much of anything to do and those who believe there's too much to do. And somewhere in all this Christendom, there's a little wafer-thin group of people who actually are going to be in the kingdom of God. What makes us so right? 